I'm James Turk from Gold Money, and it's my pleasure to be speaking today with Professor Pedro Swartz of Sa San Paulo University here in Madrid, Spain. Um, Professor Swartz doesn't need any introduction, but if you're not familiar with his work, I highly recommend viewing a video uh, on the internet debating uh, where he debates Professor Paul Krugman. The video has already gone viral, and you've probably seen it, but if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Professor Swartz, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that discussion with Professor Krugman. Uh, were you surprised that it went video, uh, viral, that video? Uh, it's the first time that anything which is not my person has gone viral when I have flu. It's the only <laughs> time I've met a virus. Yeah. But there you are. We had lots of hits. But as I understand it, it's over one million views. Yes. And the thing that I found so appealing from it is that you very logically and in a very concise and common sense way presented the Austrian school of thinking in terms of, you know, the economy and money, whereas Professor Krugman is trying to argue, you know, his theories, which may seem good in academia uh, and in theory. They don't. They don't seem good in academia either. <laughs> Uh, he is in a majority, but many people criticize his views. And it's both the people in Chicago and the people who, uh, who are with uh, the Austin School that see things very differently. And reality is different, which yes. does help to bring down bad theory. Is it in part because of how a person views his relationship to government, uh, or more generally the state? Uh, influences how they see economics and what the role the government should play? That's uh, one element. The other element is their view of human nature, <clears throat> in the sense that the people who defend the government intervening in the economy all the time to uh, fight the, uh, the cycle or to make the economy grow, see individuals as inert, as being flexible or malleable in the hands of authorities and they don't realize that we have our own plans and when we have the authorities intervening we turn around them and uh, don't do what they expect mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not understanding that people react and they are not like machines but they have their own purposes and those may very easily go against the purposes of the government. Yeah, that's one of the basic principles of Mises' book, Human Action, that individuals act in, the, in their own interest, which is only natural. In fact, you know, that's basically Adam Smith's invisible hand. It's people interacting voluntarily in the marketplace or in society, however you want to describe it, to improve their own situation. And if some impediment is imposed, however that impediment comes, whatever the source of that is, an individual will respond accordingly. And if that impediment is some form of government intervention or manipulation of the free market process, it seems only natural that an individual would react to that intervention by government. Well, indeed, they, uh, they, uh, the fashion now is to intervene in banks and, uh, and also to, uh, to try and regulate them. And it seems that bankers uh, try to find ways to go around the regulators all yeah. the time and it's only natural so that makes the the uh, the work of governments very difficult if they try to be active in society instead of simply setting the framework well let's look at the situation here in Europe and with regard to your comments about banks uh, how they've changed uh, my own bank background is I was trained as a banker back in the 1960s, but I learned banking from guys who had lived and worked through the Great Depression. So I learned banking perhaps in the traditional sense, whereas banks today have largely become hedge funds um, in terms of the risks and everything that they're taking. Does government really have a role to play to keep banks in, uh, in order or to keep them from expanding? And, in fact, you know, governments have been regulating banks, but they've expanded anyway. I mean, there's some inconsistency there, isn't there? The center of the problem, uh, and it's one that may not be, one may not avoid, is that um, banks, um, banks give more credit than they have deposits. That is, their deposits are not backed by uh, reserves. The fractional reserve That's issue. Right. But it's very difficult to get rid of that and it may be necessary to have a fractional reserve system in the present world, but one should be aware that there will be bank runs if you have that fractional reserve system. And if you don't have a fractional reserve system, then banks uh, stop being credit institutions 
and you have to have other institutions lending or investing in companies and uh, giving credit to families. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have this problem that the credit system and the banking system we've lived with for a long time is one that is subject to ups and downs. And uh, we don't really know how to fight that, whether to get rid totally of, uh, of this fractional reserve system or whether we could uh, put some, give some rules so that the fractional reserve system does not grow amok. Mm -hmm. The ups and downs, of course, being the boom and bust cycle. Yes. Um, and you know, we're still in this bust that began, I guess, in 2000, and it still has to play itself out. But I guess the point I'm getting at is that you know, we've had government regulation for decades, yet the boom and bust cycle occurs because of the fractional reserve banking. But despite the government regulation, we have catastrophes like the September of 2008 financial collapse. Mm. So is government regulation really adding value? Well, obviously it's not uh, helping, but we don't really know whether you could get rid totally of government mm. regulation or of regulation of the financial markets. I wouldn't dare say, look, let it all free and it's all going to work. It's something that we have to study very deeply and the experience of the recession we're in, I think will lead us to study more deeply what, how we could regulate the, the credit and banking system. But here in Europe, they seem to be moving toward more regulation, even though it's yet to be established that the existing level of regulation has proven itself worthwhile. Um, is that a concern that the free market and the interventions in the free market will become even greater? I, I, I can give two examples of uh, policies that are mooted or are under study in Europe and in the world and they don't seem to be very good policies in the present situation where banks are not giving credit to firms or families. One of, of these regulations is increasing capital in banks. If you make banks try to get higher, a higher capital ratio when there is a recession, then obviously the, the lending will fall. And I don't think it's the best moment to, have, uh, to impose that rule. We've had, um, we've had rules called Basel I and Basel II, and now it's Basel III. It doesn't seem that Basel I and II that were enforced before have helped at all. And why increase capital of banks at the moment when they have so much difficulty lending? And the second one is the Tobin tax that everybody speaks of. Well, this is you, the financial transaction tax. That's right. It's a tax of 0.1 or something percent that the European Union wants to put on any transactions. And that will make fewer transactions uh, and therefore, again, make banks uh, less, more, more reluctant to lend when the economy needs. So these are two examples of misguided intervention and uh, there ought to be a lot more study and discussion before we have more regulation since in the present, in the very near past it hasn't worked. Yeah, because each impediment reduces the opportunity for commerce. If you reduce the opportunity for commerce, There'll be less interaction, uh, less opportunity for people to create wealth and raise humankind's standard of living. So the impediments are actually a problem. But let's just carry this a little bit further in terms of banks and what the ECB is doing at the moment in terms of uh, now they've announced that they're going to have essentially an open-ended program where they're going to be buying uh, bonds uh, of countries where interest rates are, are high in their view. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, my impression is that uh the ECB and the Fed are playing tennis in the sense that one hits the ball very hard and the other hits it back and so I'm going to lend to the, to the economy much more than I have to or I usually did and then the Fed says oh I'm going to lend open-endedly and so on. So that it seems that central bankers are cheering each other into, uh, into creating money, creating money out of the blue. I don't think that's a very good idea. Well, with the ECB, the European Central Bank, there were rules it should obey. And those rules were due to the design that the ECB was going to be free from uh, political pressures. Like the Bundesbank. Like the Bundesbank. It's, uh, it was going to be a European Bundesbank. Right. And it didn't turn it, it isn't so, because it's giving way to political pressure, despite the opposition of the Bundesbank. So they have a rule, they cannot lend to governments, but they can 
have open market operations, as they are called, which means that the central bank can go into the market and buy uh, old bonds, old government bonds, so as to influence the amount of money in the economy. When the economy is booming, you, you, uh, you uh, sell the bonds and take money in, and when the economy is low, you buy the bonds and put money there. But this is only for the purpose of inflation control. But uh, they've gone over the edge, and now they are buying short-term bonds, well, short-term, up, up to two years, buying short-term bonds, saying they do it for economic monetary policy, but in fact, trying to boost the real economy. And that is going beyond their remit. And so the Bundesbank uh, are not happy at all with the way that the European Central Bank is pouring money into the economy. And the money that is being poured into the economy is having very little impact. Do you have a view as to why that is the case? Because you know Europe is clearly in a recession. Yes, uh, the, uh, so the banks are not lending to each other, so there is no really no re inter inter bank market. And what they do is get their liquidity not from other banks, uh, but from the European Central Bank. And then they do something peculiar, which is to deposit that money with the European Central Bank, because they have a lack of faith on how the economy is going. So the only thing, that money is being uh, kept in the European Central Bank, and the European Central Bank creates more and more, and so on, it's there in a, in a sort of tub. And what will happen when the economy again booms uh, with all that money parked there, I think it'll go into the system and then we'll have a, a worrying inflation. So the system is not working at all. Central bank creating uh, liquidity, the liquidity being put back into to the central bank, uh, sometimes with, with commercial banks gaining, making money on it, uh, or put into the tills of the government, but not yet going into the economy. At some point it will and then we might have a big inflation. Before we get into inflation, which I would like to discuss, um, I just want to explain or get into this point a little bit in more detail to make sure uh, that uh, our viewers understand the important point that you're making. Uh, the ECB cannot buy a bond directly from, say, the Italian government or no. the Spanish government. Yeah. What the Italian government or the Spanish government will do is they will offer bonds and they will be bought by Spanish or Italian banks. And the Italian bank then sells that to the ECB uh, in exchange for funds. Is there, as a practical matter, any difference between the ECB buying directly from the government or the ECB buying indirectly from a Spanish or Italian bank, that government bond? If there is one, I can't see it. No, I can't see it either. That's why I wanted to make this point clear for the and viewers. Then, that and then Max, uh, and, the ECB... And we call that printing money, right? Absolutely. You don't need to print it now because it's all uh, on computers. It's so it's, it's much easier. You don't have to use any ink to make money. And then you have another thing that the ECB is doing. It lends when uh, commercial banks are in trouble, they can go to the European Central Bank and ask for money uh, because the ECB is the, what called the lender of last resort. They have a duty to save sound banks from being going broke. So they, they go to the central bank and they ask for money at 1% and then they buy. With that, they buy government bonds at 4, 5, 6%. Yeah. Lovely business, but is that productive for the economy? I don't think so. Is this really an open market operation or is it a purchase of a bond to try to maintain the illusions that these governments are solvent and continue to fund deficits with debt? Um, you know, is it the, or the combination of the two? There is some legitimate open market operations, but also just funding government deficits and turning them into currency. Well, there's legitimate uh, operation of the lender of last resort, which you need when you have a fractional reserve system, because you have runs on banks, and then the banks may be sound, but they can't sell everything they but have. That, that's a short-term liquidity. That's short term, yeah. but then you have the other one, which is that uh, that government bonds are being bought by banks because they, got, they get the finance from the ECB. Now, uh, the illusion is not there, and I'll tell you a figure of it. Last year, 55% of Spanish government bonds were in the hands of foreigners. After a year, it's less than 30. 
And all those bonds are going into Spanish banks, which are taking the bonds and lending the government. It's a, it's a circle, a vicious circle. Yeah. Uh, and we have a vicious circle somewhere else. The social security system, the pension system, has a reserve fund in case that they don't get enough income so as to keep f uh, pensions flowing. And of course this reserve fund is equivalent to nine months of pensions and they're safe, they say, because they're investing in Spanish government bonds. So you have the, this whole rigmarole of short-term arrangements but the confidence in the whole system is very low. They call that a daisy chain. Um, it is a daisy chain. <laughs> because everybody is connected to one another, it's, or it's like two drunks holding up each other by leaning against each other. I call it musical chairs, uh, and somebody suddenly will fall without a chair. When the music stops. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, you know, one of the, ex if, if you look at German monetary history in the 20th century, um, the currency was destroyed twice, and the reason why it was destroyed is the central bank was buying government paper, in this case German government paper, and turning it into currency. Um, and ultimately they turned so much of that paper into currency that the currency ultimately collapsed. What you're suggesting here at the ECB level is basically the same thing, that turning government paper into currency to try to fund government deficits as opposed to short-term open market operations to maintain solvency and liquidity in the banking system could be leading to a serious round of hyperinflation in the not too distant future? Two reflections here. One, they hope that it won't go get out of hand if governments reduce their deficits. So if this kind of financing is seen as a stopgap measure while governments are reducing deficits and, uh, and uh, putting their house in order, then maybe it won't grow and grow and grow. So the condition for it not being too dangerous, it is already rather dangerous, but not being too dangerous or catastrophic, is that governments at some point will stop issuing bonds because they don't have a, a deficit. And so the deficit uh, reduction is essential for this kind of operation not being catastrophic. Now, if, they don't, if you don't do that and you keep having and deficits and you keep printing money, there comes a point when it goes into prices and then people uh, see prices going up and they, lack, they lose confidence in the currency. Uh, in 1921-22, during the big German hyperinflation, prices changed every day and even every hour and people looked at the rate of exchange of the then uh, Lands Landsmark and the pound, and they changed the prices overnight uh, in, if, if the Landmark was devalued. So prices go up relentlessly, and there may come a point when not enough money is printed. So what you're actually focusing on is there are two elements to, to money. You know, we talk a lot about the supply of money, M1, M2, M3, but we really don't talk too much about the demand for money. But what you're focusing on here is that the demand for money is just as important, perhaps even more important, than ultimately the supply of money. Because if people lose confidence, they're going to exit that into goods and services or other forms of money for which they do have confidence. Indeed. And that could cause inflation, maybe even hyperinflation. And then, uh, and then uh, the, the people will have money want to spend it because it burns their hands, but perhaps the people who sell don't want that money. And, and so the confidence is lost in, in the money and uh, uh, money becomes, in a way, becomes scarce because people don't take it, prices go up so much that you don't have enough money to buy things. Yeah. But let me get back to the point you were making about um, the anticipation of reducing the deficits so that the government uh, doesn't put out more debt. The reality, though, is that most European governments are, spend, are, are 40 to 50 percent of the economy. If they're cutting back on their spending, they're cutting back on economic activity um, and probably also cutting back on tax receipts, which means that they're going to have even less money to spend. But, you know, and I don't see the deficits shrinking, you know, simply because governments have become so big. 
I don't see how, the, how this is going to work itself out. Do you have any thoughts as to how it's going to play out? The deficit may shrink if indeed you in increase taxes, the intake by the government, and they make some cuts. Uh, but it's one thing to have a zero deficit at a very high level of government activity and a zero deficit at a high level of private activity, because the latter is the one that makes the economy grow. So authorities, international authorities, the IMF, the ECB, the European Union and so on, are only thinking of how to balance the government accounts. They are not thinking of how big the government, uh, the, the government sector is and how it's crowding out the private sector. Yeah. So there are two things that should be done. Of course, not be not uh, ask for too much money, and the government uh, uh, shouldn't put out so many bonds. But the second one is that the amount of government action should be lower so that private people can produce real wealth. But how can the private sector grow when, for example, here in Spain, the, the VAT, or what they call the IVA, is just going up to 21% from 18%, I believe it was previously. I mean, increasing taxes is going to be an additional burden on the private sector, making it less likely that the private sector is going to create the wealth that's needed. I agree. So you should, you should reduce the deficit not by increasing taxes, but by reducing expenditure. The, uh, I was, uh, I, we married our daughter last week, and we needed lots of flowers. So I went to the florist, and his VAT went up from 8%, to 21%. Wow. They, they really didn't know where to look yeah. or what to do. And the same with many other things. So it's not by increasing taxes that you, uh, uh, you're reducing the deficit properly, but it's the other way you should cut expenditure. Yes. And indeed, if higher taxes mean higher intake, which sometimes is doubtful. Will politicians really cut spending uh, or do they need a crisis or a catastrophe before they see the light? and recognize that the policies they've been following um, are not sustainable. An American economist, Paul Romer, has said, you can't waste a good crisis. And indeed, here we have a big crisis, and I think it's making many of us realize <coughs> that things can't go on as before. A, the government cannot spend that much. Uh, secondly, incentives are wrong when you fund services, social services or public services, with taxes. There ought to be a much bigger role of people paying for those services and paying for going to the doctor or for using roads or for going to school. Then that makes people more aware of how it costs them rather than the tax. The tax gets lost somewhere. And it also makes the suppliers of, of those services uh, w work better. So. Uh, it's, it's, that is one thing that you need to do. Will, uh, will governments cut on their expenditure? There's another thing that uh, we have to realize in this crisis. These, the uh, welfare state is unsustainable. It's clear, at least in the form in which it is. Yes, and here it's not politicians who are to blame. It's us, the voters. Mm. The politicians look over their shoulders and see if they can win the next election. And if they uh, cut down on social services and on entitlements and so on, they are afraid of losing votes. So we need not only a better politicians, but a change in social mentality, where people will say, A, nothing's free. You always have to pay something for it. It's better if you pay because then the thing works well. And if you do it all through taxes, then you hope your neighbour will pay for what you spend. Especially, they say, the very rich will pay because we are going to put their taxes up. Yes. Well, there is an American philosopher by the name of George Santayana who said basically that if you ignore history, you're condemned to relive it. And unfortunately, people don't really look back in history. So it's much easier to just listen to the siren song of politicians who make promises they cannot deliver than it is to go back and actually research and study history. So to a certain extent, aren't, isn't the population being lulled by politicians? It's been lulled by politicians, but also they are receiving those services. It's not only that they're being promised. They're now, being bribed. 
bribed is a, is a way, but also they, they are accustomed to having free health services yeah. or free education in part of our education system or having uh, pensions being paid by the government. And so it's having benefits that they have to give up and nobody tells them there's another way to have those benefits if you save for your pension, if you pay for your education or your health, you will get a better service and in the end you'll have more money to spend on other things. But that, you see, we, we, it's, it's rather a bit like a drug. We are on it, accustomed, and withdrawing from it is painful. Yeah, understood. Um, are you in favor of privatization and do you see any movement toward that anywhere in Europe? Yes, there is privatization in, in different things. Uh, for example, the British ha have increased what people have to pay for university uh, very sharply. And now... With huge protests by the population. There's huge pro of course, because it's lovely to have free university. taking something away, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, thinking that other people will pay for it. Yeah. So the British have put that up. Then uh, we here in Spain are beginning to charge for medicines when you go to the pharmacy and get your drug, uh, the medicine. So now you're being to charge. And last month, the new very, very small charge for going and getting your drugs at the pharmacist has been put in. The demand for drugs has fallen by 24%. Mm -hmm. So imagine, it's not that people are less healthy, it's that they don't waste and they ask for smaller amounts and so on. Yeah. So that, that is the question that we ought to see through experiment and through experience that if you don't get all this free on taxes you're better off not worse off as people think they are yeah I, you know there's a basic principle that i've always thought important that if you use it you pay for it um, but if you use it you shouldn't expect other people to pay for it i think it comes down to a question of you know self-reliance and um, uh, personal responsibility but isn't that lost a lot uh, in recent Yes, I know, I know there's a sort of ethical question there, but I think we people at university, people who write in the papers, thinkers and so on, and philosophers are much to blame for, uh, for putting forth, forth um, theories that are cr clearly wrong. For example, um, you could think that <coughs> private education that you pay for is all right for the rich, but not for the poor because the poor can't afford it. But this is not the experience. You have in Africa and in India and China a lot of private schools and they are better uh, for the poor because they are paid by the poor with very small amounts. Uh, for example, in, in India, private schools teach the children in cramped buildings and so on, but they teach them in English, not in the local language. And so families, families who are uh, illiterate, who have simply get pennies, go to those private schools. So we all say, oh, it's more generous to, for the poor to promise them a, a pension, to promise them totally free education and totally free health. But in the end, it's the poor who suffer and get a worse service. That's the old Confucius saying, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach him how to fish, you, you feed him for life. Uh, that it's people will appreciate something that they have to work toward. And what I guess you describe in terms of the private school system is the beauty of the market. It's the spontaneity of people interacting with one another, um, not necessarily in, in, as an individual, but as a group, uh, in terms of developing a, a, uh, an alternative that they prefer to you know, other things or in the absence of other things that may, may not exist. Yes, and the market <clears throat> will make for more efficiency, for less waste, and for perhaps the, the education system being uh, aware of the demands of the families and their children. And, and so they'll be, uh, they'll be more attuned to what people want. Here, here in Spain, <clears throat> and it's not only the public education system, but private subsidized system that is told what to teach uh, almost every hour you know what people are being taught and with what books and the only uh, remnant of censorship of books that exists is books for schools here in Spain because they have to be taught the right thing mm. and schooling is used for increasing national sentiment and for uh, putting ideas into people's heads. Increasing reliance head. on the state rather than 
personal responsibility and personal reliance? Yes, it's uh, personal responsibility and the belief that if you get free education, you get good education because you'll have the planner who will say what, people, what children should know. And in the end, what you have is 15% of British population, 18% of the Spanish population being in fact illiterate because they can simply read a headline yeah. or the sign going exit or toilets, but they can't read anymore. Yeah. And then you have uh, some 52% of Spanish youth unemployed, of which 20, the half, half of it are, are, are people who are looking for a job and can't get it or have left the labor force. Yeah. So the, the education system is not working, but we, the people who speak, who write and who think, should put it tirelessly across saying, don't you think that you're getting something? You're getting nothing. You could get much more if you were able to pay for it. Yes, understood. I, I think we both agree that the present system as it's structured is uh, unsustainable and that something has to give eventually. Can it evolve gradually so that there's not a major catastrophe or collapse or is it more likely that you're going to have a crisis, a catastrophe and we go to a hopefully more properly structured system? I don't think there will be a catastrophe unless there is a hyperinflation. That would really change things. I think governments and central banks will be able to <clears throat> sort of manage the wild horses of inflation and other things. So I, th I think it's, it's, a long, it'll, it's going to be a long-term change. Well, let me ask you this, because you say they'll be able to manage is manage the right word or will they end up trying to control? And if they end up trying to control, won't that actually make the situation that much worse? Because they'll be going back to interventions and preventing the free market from expressing itself, individuals from expressing itself, you know, pursuing things to fulfill their needs and wants um, without impediments. I, my, my, my feeling is that we are reducing the uh, rate of growth of economies and what we will have is more control and more intervention and less growth. <clears throat> Rather than a big catastrophe, it's going to be a greyer world, I think. The catastrophe could come if we have a hyperinflation, but if not, it's simply going to be less growth. It's going to be, uh, if we speak to Americans, it's going to be a European situation. See, when, when people in America criticize certain policies, uh, they say, they, you want to be like Europe. Well. Uh, it would be the wrong choice. Yeah, well, politicians, I think, are always, you know, blaming somebody else or, you know, making promises based on other things they see, but oftentimes really don't deliver. Um, is it really a failure of the system that we're seeing today? Failure of politicians, failure of individuals? I mean, it, it's, it's quite frightening in some respects where we're headed. If you look at the problems uh, uh, that we have presently and what's happened in the past when you've had economic problems, you know, it could lead to a currency collapse and then you're talking about a really dire set of circumstances. It could, but I'm not sure it will and they will try to avoid it because there is some knowledge of what, uh, of what policies taken to the bitter end will, will give in, in currency. I, I tend not to blame politicians as much because they are bad managers of popular will. Uh, they, they try to think of themselves and they put forth promises that they can't fulfill. True. But in the end, it's the belief of ordinary people or the, about the kind of society they can have and a, a kind of society that they can afford. And uh, this is now spreading to the East, to China, to uh, Korea, South Korea and Singapore and so on, they're beginning to introduce a welfare state. And so we'll see, I think, that part of the world starting to grow less quickly. Mm -hmm. So how can we convince people, uh, help people to see that this kind of system we have is not the one they, whose results they would prefer? It's a, it's a long job. I think that's, that's what we're doing here. Well, I was going to say, doesn't that come down to education? 
education, uh, like your Krugman propaganda, debate, uh, you that's know, right. getting at um, both points of view so that people can make a decision for themselves. Because there are really two things. You have to decide your role in society as well as your role as an individual. Mm -hmm. And I think both of those decisions are important, but at the end of the day, every individual has to decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. Correct? True. Uh, and. Uh, we decide for ourselves within the system and try to, you know, to get advantages we shouldn't get. In the end, uh, with a with a less intervened system, I think families would function better and the education of children would be better. Uh, so, it really is in the beginning a matter for philosophers, who should uh, tirelessly go on explaining what they see as the proper thing, way of behaviour, and then uh, public opinion forcing politicians to behave differently. We have a very di very interesting uh, election coming up in the United States, in America. And you see what you don't see in Europe, a large chunk of the population not being taken in by false promises. We'll see who wins. Yes, that should be interesting indeed. Well, Professor Schwartz, this has been a real pleasure and an honor to have this opportunity. If I come back to Madrid, I'd like to do it again, if that's okay with you. No, I'm all right. On... This is not the first time I'll do it again. Okay. Uh, I said tirelessly, tirelessly. You, you are tireless and you're also an ex excellent educator. And I, again, recommend to everyone, if you haven't seen that discussion with Professor Krugman, um, please do so. It's viral and it's probably going to become more viral already. Thank you very much. It's been Thank a real you. pleasure. Thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.